Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. You have to decide that you are going to dedicate every area of your life to God. Your mouth, your thoughts, your ears, what you're even willing to listen to, your eyes, what you're willing to look at, your entertainment, your social life, your friendships, how you dress, your appetite, finances. We need to have a return to more holiness. And real holiness is not legalism. It doesn't mean you can't do anything. It doesn't mean you can't have any fun. We have lots of liberty in Christ. Wonderful, beautiful liberty. Paul said, all things are allowable for me, but not all things are the best thing for me to do. God is, he's given us the freedom of choice. And there are many things that you can get by with, and it won't send you to hell, but it will keep you from living a victorious life here. Yeah. Yeah. Now, did you hear me? Yeah. I must say it again. There are many things that you can do, and it won't send you to hell. But it is going to hurt your witness. It may make you unusable by God, because he said we should be vessels fit for the master's use. And we must be anointed by God to work for God, and God does not anoint the flesh. The anointing oil was never put on the flesh. Dedicating ourselves is very easy to say. I could stop right now and have a dedication service. And I could have people up here at this altar bawling and squalling, and we could lay hands on people that didn't have any hair left and lay everybody out on the floor. And I mean, it would just, you'd go home thinking, man, the glory was there. Well, I'll tell you where I want to see the glory. I want to see it in your homes. I want to see it when you go home and you follow through. Amen? Some of you know very well right now specific areas that are hindering you, that are displeasing to God. God's already been dealing with you about it. All he's doing right now, he's just sent me as another confirmation to you. Not like you haven't had others. But here I am now as another confirmation to you. We're educated way beyond our level of obedience. <laughs> How many times are we going to have to hear the forgive your enemies message before we do it? Yeah. It's much easier to say amen in here than it will be to go home and pull it off. But I believe that you're going to get the message tonight and you're going to learn how to finish what you start. There's some wonderful examples in the Bible. First of all, in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 10 and 11, the Bible says that it is God's desire that we go all the way through. But we do strongly and earnestly desire for each of you to show the same diligence and sincerity all the way through. See, we get started, but somewhere in the middle, we give up. That we might enjoy the fulfillment of our dreams in the end. A woman came to the altar one time to ask me to pray for her about losing some weight. And as I, just as I touched her, I just had a vision of her. And I saw her like... She'd make a decision and she'd get started. And then she'd turn around and go back. And she'd get prayer somewhere again. And then she'd take off and she'd get started. <laughs> and then she'd give up and go back and get prayer somewhere again. And she had spent years just... Come on, I'm talking to somebody. I said, I'm talking to somebody. Now see, right here is where it gets kind of hard. 
And this is a place where you got to go. <laughs> so you can come out with some victory somewhere on the other end. And please remember, you never have to do this by yourself. Any person who will say to God, I am going to go all the way through with you, let me tell you, I mean, he gets all over it. You know when I sense God's anointing on me to do what I'm doing? When I step out here. I don't feel it before that. If you're waiting to feel the right thing before you do the right thing. It just doesn't work that way. You know, the Bible is full of people who went all the way through with God. There are a few that you read a little bit about and then something happens and they just kind of fizzle out and you never hear from them again. But Hannah, for example, was a woman who was unable to bear children and she prayed and prayed and prayed that God would give her a child. And she said to God, if you'll bless me and let me have a child, I'll give him back to you and I promise that he'll serve you all the days of his life. Now, when she gave her child back to God, it wasn't like us doing a baby dedication and giving our children to God and then taking them home and still doing what we want to with them. I mean, when she decided to give her child to God, that meant when she weaned that child, she had to go take him to the temple, and that's where he would live for the rest of his life in priestly service. And it's beautiful if you read it, how she waited until she weaned him. And then on the day when she was supposed to take him, she went and she spoke to the prophet, and she said, I'm the woman who stood by this altar and prayed that God would give me this child. And as I promised you, I have now come to give him back to you. If people would just keep their promises, if they would just keep their word, we need integrity in our world today. We need people who will say what they're going to do and do what they said. And there's such a lacking of that in our society today. And let me tell you something, church. The sinners aren't going to change. If anybody's going to spark up the world, it's going to have to be us. We've got to get out there and be bright lights, stars and beacons shining out in a dark world. We have to press in and every individual person who calls themselves a Christian must begin to live that life out in society where it makes a difference. People don't pay all that much attention to what we say. But they do pay attention to what we do. Let's look at Acts chapter 5. Is anybody feeling anything stirring on the inside tonight? Actually, I'm going to back up into Acts chapter 4, the last two verses. It says, Now Joseph, a Levite and a native of Cyprus... Which, interestingly enough, we have an office in Cyprus now. <laughs> well, actually, we broadcast to the Middle East out of that area. So Joseph, a Levite and a native of Cyprus who was surnamed Barnabas by the apostles, which interpreted means son of encouragement, sold a field which belonged to him and brought the sum of money and laid it at the feet of the apostles. Now, you know, I don't know, maybe when, he, maybe when they did that, the people were just like, oh, that's great, Joseph, you're a great guy, hallelujah. Well, then Ananias and Sapphira, seeing what went on, they said, oh, we've got a field, we're going to sell it and we'll bring the money too. You know, sometimes we make commitments in the flesh. And it's not even something that God's put on our heart and... But you know what? I believe that even if we make a commitment when we should have just kept our mouth shut, God expects us to keep our word. And if not, the very least he wants you to do is go back and say, you know what? I was just totally in the flesh. I wasn't hearing from God at all. Didn't even pray about it. And I need to ask you to release me. But very often we don't want to do either one. We just ignore it. And then it just doesn't look good. 
But a certain man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property, and with his wife's knowledge and connivance, he kept back and wrongfully appropriated some of the proceeds, bringing only a part and putting it at the feet of the apostles. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart? Notice, when we don't keep our commitments, it's because Satan fills our heart with something. That you should lie to and attempt to deceive the Holy Spirit and should, in violation of your promise, withdraw secretly and appropriate to your own use part of the price from the sale of the land. As long as it remained unsold, was it not still your own? And even after it was sold, was not the money at your own disposal? It is that you have proposed and purposed in your heart to do this thing. So he didn't have to say, I'll give it all. He could have sold it and said, I'm going to give part of it. The whole message here is not keeping your word. The whole message here is not doing what you say you'll do, not finishing what you start. How could you have had the heart to do such a deed? You have not simply lied to men, playing false and showing yourself utterly deceitful, but you lied to God. Verse 5, upon hearing these words, Ananias fell down and died. You know, this is really serious. Now, I just want you to stick with me here for a minute because I'm going to show you a correlation. So he fell down and died, and terror took possession of all who heard it. Verse 6, and the young men arose and wrapped up the body and carried it out and buried it. Now, after an interval of about three hours, the wife came in, not having learned yet of what had happened. And Peter said to her, tell me, did you sell the land for such and such amount of money? And she said, oh, yes, for that much. And then Peter said to her, how could you two have agreed and conspired together to try to deceive the Spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. And instantly she fell down and died. Now, isn't this an encouraging message tonight? <laughs> and just think, this is almost over, and I can send you home with these thoughts. <laughs> and the young men entering found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Now, watch this. And the whole church and all the others who heard of these things were appalled in great awe and strange terror and dread seized them. Now by the hands of the apostles, the special messengers, numerous and startling signs and wonders were being performed among the people, and by common consent they all met together in the temple. Now, you notice that Ananias and Sapphira fell down dead from lying, but you also notice that great signs and wonders and tremendous miracles were happening in the church and people were being added to the church daily by the thousands. Now, if we wonder where the miracles have gone, well, come on, you're all smarter than that. <laughs> Then maybe we need to have a great return to holiness and have a little more reverential fear and awe. Dave and I were just talking about this last week, this very thing. And we both feel very much that there's just a little too much looseness in the church. God's our buddy and He's our friend, but He's also God Almighty. A holy God, a righteous God, a God of justice. And we should never have a wrong fear of God, but we should know that God means what He says. And it's not wrong to have a, a righteous, reverential fear and awe of God. And when we do, things will change. Even just some of the rude behaviors that we have. And I, you know, this is not about trying to hurt somebody's feelings or, or embarrass anybody, but I mean, even just like at the end of a service when the pastor is trying to have an altar call to have people give their life to the Lord, and the only thing that 20% of the people are concerned about is trying to get out of the building so they can get their car out of the parking lot, so they can get their hamburger. I mean, are we really in that big a hurry that we have to be rude to the Holy Spirit? 
and maybe interrupt somebody who's lost and going to hell that the Holy Spirit is trying to bring conviction on? We should not have to be told those things because every person who does that, who's truly born again, knows in their spirit when they get up that it's wrong. You know, Joseph was a consecrated man, and he didn't lose his dedication and consecration through all kinds of trials and tribulations. And he ended up second in command in the whole nation of Egypt. Let me tell you something. Payday will come. Payday will come. And when God's payday comes, mm, 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 mm. <laughs> Woo! Esther had her own plan. She was a young maiden, and I don't know what Esther had planned, but it sure wasn't to go be part of a harem in the king's palace. She was asked to put her life on the line, but because she dedicated herself, she saved a whole nation. You have no idea what God could do with you. Now, in this last little bit of time that I have left, I want to talk to you about an area of dedication that I think is important for all of us and it's dedicating your reputation to God. You know, our reputation is what people think of us. It's their opinion. And we're way too concerned about what people think. It's just like, it's almost like a disease in our society. And everybody wants people to like them. There's no doubt about that. But I can tell you right now, everybody's not going to like you. I don't care what you do. Not everybody's going to like your new haircut. Not everybody's going to like your new clothes. Not everybody's going to like the car you picked. Not everybody's going to like your personality. I mean, not everybody's going to like you. Thank God a lot of people will, but not everybody will. And you will have to learn how to experience some rejection in your life and yet shake that off and go on with God. I'm reading a book right now by A.W. Tozier. And of course, he wrote this book a fair number of years ago, so they had the same problem in the church then. And he said, what we have in the church now is deadly respectability. And yet in the midst of it, Christians are not, by and large, respected by the world. And we should be. Even if they don't like us or want to be like us, they should respect us. And the only way they will is if we live the life that we say we believe in. We have to live the life that we say that we believe. You know, the Apostle Paul said in Galatians 1.10, if I were trying to be popular with people, I would not right now be an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know that trying to be popular with people, trying to maintain your relationship can steal the plan of God for your life? Do you know that? I'm quite sure that Noah had to lose his reputation to build the ark. What do you think? I bet Abraham didn't have a very good reputation when he walked off from his whole family and everything that he knew and left and said, God's calling me. Well, where are you going, Abraham? I don't know. God just said, go and I'll show you. Why, you nutcase. Come on. Jesus didn't have a good reputation, but the Bible says in Philippians 2, 7 that he made himself of no reputation. Yeah, yeah. He just went ahead and got it all over with to start with. That's great. His brothers thought he was crazy. People thought he was a madman. But he just stayed focused and kept doing. I don't even know how to explain to you what all I went through when God first called me to do this over 35 years ago. I mean, it was a very hard, lonely time for me. And I said today, about two weeks ago, I said, you know what? I just, I have no idea how I got from where I was to where I am. I do not know how I managed to get through all of the stuff that came against me Except that one day at a time, I took it with God 
And I, one of the things I had, and let me finish, one of the things that I had, I mean, I had this, I am not going to give up. I mean, it's just like quitting is just like something I can't even get into my brain. I am not going to quit and give up. And I know that God gave me a lot of grace. Certainly I wouldn't be if it wasn't for that. But I'm just going to tell you that anybody can quit. That doesn't take any talent at all or any help from God. Anybody can quit. So the next time you say, well, I'm just going to give up, you just ought to turn around and kick your own self in the rump. Because that is just something you should never do. If you can't have any other testimony, at least have this one, I'm still here. Yeah. Amen. I'm still here. No matter what the devil threw against me, I'm still here. And I'll tell you what, I'd rather have God as my friend than to have 1,000 half-baked, phony, hypocritical pretenders who the only way they're going to be my friend is if they can control me and manipulate me and I'll do everything they want me to do. Either love me for who I am or just don't bother loving me at all. Amen? I believe when I was studying today that God showed me that this is one of the main things he's wanting to get at tonight. Some of you are never going to finish what God wants you to finish in life if you don't lay this reputation on the altar. Now I can tell you right now that it's going to be very easy for you to agree with me here. But you're going to get tested. Everything worth anything has to pass the test. And let me tell you something. God tests and tries us that we might come out like pure gold. Now listen to me, you won't finish what God's got for you to do if you care too much what people think. You're always going to be changing your decisions to make them happy, lest they think that you're wrong or crazy or weird or, you know. How many of you agree that it's a real problem that we're that concerned about what other people think? And I mean, it, it is a massive, massive problem. And I can actually look back at my history in ministry. And I can see now that each time God was trying to do something major in my life. Like when he was calling me into ministry. You wouldn't believe the flack I got just for trying to teach a Bible study in my home. I mean, it was unbelievable. It was like all the devils in hell came out. <laughs> and you know, the enemy works through people. And sometimes godly people, or at least they're supposed to be. But hey, before we point the finger at too many other people, let's remember that sometimes we let them work through us too. Yeah. Amen? And that rejection was so painful to me. So painful. And I remember one day when I was still like in my early 30s and God had filled me with the Spirit and called me to preach. And I was listening to a teaching CD about righteousness. And I was so excited. The very thought of being right with God was just like almost more than I could stand. Because I'd had a lifetime full of guilt and shame and condemnation. And all these people were coming against us and our friends were rejecting us and laughing at me and telling me I was crazy and who do you think you are and all these things. And I'm trying to hold on to this little dream and vision. Didn't know anything about dreams and visions to start with. And probably thought I was crazy myself. Was hoping I wasn't. <laughs> and I remember getting in my kitchen floor on my knees and I had that teaching on righteousness in my hand. And I said, God, I don't even fully understand all this. 
but I know that you're trying to do something in my life. And if I lose every friend that I've got and everybody thinks I'm stark raven mad, I'm going to press forward with you. And I've had to do that a number of times in my life, probably about four times that were really, 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 really major for me, where I've had major hits of rejection from people that I really thought were my friends. You know, it's painful when you think people are your friends and then you find out that they're not. It's probably one of the most painful things in the world. But I'm still here. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And I'm not going away. Hallelujah. Because I want to be here to encourage you that if you will go all the way through with God, oh, you will have a payday that will knock your socks off. Well, I pray that today's message has motivated you to follow through on what you start. You know, it's very easy to begin something but it does take great courage to finish it. 